then. Hi there, thanks Robin, thanks everyone. Um, and thanks Kate for that. It was really interesting to hear a different perspective on things. I, my uh, my role in, in cybersecurity is I'm a, I'm a lawyer. So I head up the intellectual property IT and data protection law team at a firm called Stephen Scone. And I suspect my my uh, perspective is slightly different to, to, to everybody else's, which is why it's really interesting for me to hear what, what what's going on for you guys in your world. For us, we approach data protection and cybersecurity from two angles. One is where innovation and the law, technology and the law intersect. So helping innovators who are developing new products, the sort of things that you have in your home or, or you download onto your phone and helping them make sure those are secure in the first place. However, the, uh, the sad reality is that this remains the wheels have come off problem for us. Um, we only really get, well, a huge percentage of our inquiries come when the wheels have come off. Something's gone wrong. Somebody's had a breach. Somebody's had an attack. They've lost a load of money. They've lost a, a database or some other source of infringement has happened. And try as we might to raise awareness about the proactive things that people can do to reduce the risks. Uh, it's a sad fact that it's still the uh, after the event that they come to us. As well as um, the work that we do uh, with businesses, we partner with Devon Corn Police and the Victim of Crime Unit. So in the event that people or organizations are victims of cyber attacks uh, and they feel they would benefit from further support, then they're directed to us. And that's often around what can you do um, to reduce your risks. Uh, and so great also to hear the expertise here that might be available to help people with that initiative as well. Um, what I thought I would do briefly is um, go through just a few of the um, uh, trends that we're seeing at the moment, uh, both in terms of the, what, what businesses are doing, but also in terms of emerging technologies. And um, if I can uh, risk it, perhaps a couple of predictions for what might happen in the future, which I know is uh, dangerous, especially as the session's being recorded, so it doesn't come back to bite me. Um, one of the obvious trends that we're seeing is this work from home movement, and I'm not going to go on about that at great length because the, um, the, the security risks of working from home are well documented. But I think one of the more interesting um, shifts of the working from home movement is the um, impact it's had on people's willingness to, to experiment with and use tools that they might not have used in the past. Uh, so whereas before organizations might have gone through a lengthy procurement process where you might have hoped they would do and it would have checked the security of the tools they're using. Now there's a much more of a tendency just to, to see what's out there, grab what's out there and use it. We, for example, are doing this on a on a Zoom call and there's, there's we could have been on Teams, we could have been on all sorts of other platforms. Those all those sorts of platforms have terms and conditions attached to them, which are very different from what people are used to in other communication methods. If you're communicating something sensitive, you wouldn't expect the Royal Mail to open the envelope and check what's in there before it reaches the recipient. But on platforms like this, the organizers reserve the right to record meetings and drop into meetings and listen to them to make sure the tech's working and all those sorts of things. So you've instantly got a disconnect between people's expectations of what the technology does and what they're entitled to expect from the technology and what the technology provider thinks that they should be entitled to do. And again, the old adage that um, you know you get what you pay for, people are jumping on to free tools without then checking those sorts of issues. And that's before we start talking about the, the security levels of those, those platforms, just the pure, uh, the sensitive conversation, maybe it's subject to non-disclosure agreements, maybe there's sensitive confidential information, it's gonna be discussed on a non-confidential platform, something which would have been unthinkable a couple of years ago, but because of people's appetites for um, easy online tools, something that happens every day now. Um, I think part of that issue, again, in terms of, of trends is because a lot of those tools are based overseas. And uh, as you'll be familiar, we in the UK have some of the most robust legislation around for cybersecurity and data protection, GDPR generally. And that's not the same uh, across all territories. A lot of the tools we're using are US based. And from my experience of uh, working on committees in the US, where I, I engage on these sorts of activities quite a lot, US business was slow to the party when it came to data security and um, data citizens' rights. But also culturally, there is a difference. Uh, and this is a broad sweeping statement, but, but generally speaking, there is more of an impetus on the individuals to look after themselves rather than for the businesses to look after the individuals in some of those territories than there might be in the UK. And I think that runs through the design, the build of those tools, and in terms then the, the security that those tools, remember I'm talking about free online tools that businesses are starting to use all over the place, um, might uh, work, uh, might use, sorry. 
in turn, I think linked to that greater uh, increased appetite for using these sorts of tools, we are seeing more international data transfers than ever before. Uh, whereas back in 2018, 2019, every business was saying to their user base, we don't send your data overseas. Most of them did, but didn't realize they were doing it because of the tools they were using. Now it happens all the time, probably more so than ever. And so we've got a bizarre situation where the legislation and, and GDPR I'm picking on here is, um, it, it is ramping up the obligations around data transfer overseas, but the business community is just getting on and doing it anyway, probably ignorant of the risks that they're, they're creating by, by doing so. In turn, prior to the pandemic, we were seeing a trend for data minimization so businesses trying to reduce their risk by just getting rid of data they didn't need. And that's starting to change again. And I think, again, that's partly to do with the low cost of data storage and transfer and the way these tools facilitate the um, and encourage the use of or uploading of as much data as possible. So the, the, the trend toward data minimization, there's still some businesses doing that, but it seems to have been um, uh, thrown out of the window by most. And that, of course, creates cybersecurity risks because those organizations have got more data about individuals than they might have otherwise had. Finally, on this bit of the sort of topic, I think we've seen an increase in, in I'm not sure this is going to catch on, but what I'm calling security washing in the same way that businesses do greenwashing. Um, so you've all seen those American, usually it's American providers that say we're GDPR compliant. Um, to which lots of UK businesses see that as a salve to, okay, well, it must be okay, I can do what I like using this tool. Um, and we all know on this call, I'm sure that that's, that's a nonsense and that um, whether or not that business is GDP compliant has no bearing whatsoever on how a UK business uses it in the same way as a, a car can be road legal, but that doesn't mean the driver can drive it around at 40 and a 30. Um, it's certainly an, the case that more education is needed for UK businesses on how they use those tools. At the moment, they're like kids in a candy shop with free, free online um, bits of kit that they can use. It's really, um, I think, shifted as well that this isn't in the mind of innovators as much as it was a couple of years ago. And I do think this revolution around working from home and online tools and free, readily available data analytic tools and so on is part of that. So a lot of innovators are spending a lot of time debating whether they can technically do something rather than asking whether they should be doing something. Um, and that is something that's definitely increased, even in, in sectors where there's really sensitive data like healthcare, uh, where people's hearts might be in the right place, um, but they're creating all sorts of vulnerabilities. So big shifts, um, I think, in that, and probably a big shift backwards in many ways compared to where we were 2018, 2019. So that, that, that's a little bit really about business attitudes, my experience of that. In terms of emerging technologies, there are four really that I wanted to talk about and um, we, can, we can play um, technology talk bingo with this if you like. So um, the first one um, is blockchain, there you go. So mark that off your, off, off your cards. Um, as a lawyer, blockchain is really simple. Um, people make a lot of um, fuss about blockchain and what blockchain can do and, and so on and so forth. And, but this is a great area where we are applying legislation which existed before blockchain was even a thought, but we can use that uh, legislation. It's got enough flex in it because of the way it's built to be able to deal with those situations. For our purposes today, the, um, the, the major concern which nobody has yet dealt with is the conflict between blockchain and the right to be forgotten. So GDPR is one of the data fundamentals, uh, sorry, one of the fundamental rights for data citizens is that we have the ability to have our data scrubbed. And there are a few exceptions to that, but where you see innovation that's using blockchain to store personal data, which might be identifiable data about people, that's automatically um, going to cause some issues from a compliance and a cybersecurity point of view. I haven't seen anybody deal with that properly yet. Nobody talks about that. Um, the next thing, get your cards ready, is voice search. Um, so we see voice search as the next battleground for particularly brand owners in a similar way that the internet was a little while ago. And this is because for many of the voice search providers, the first person to register the term that's being searched against is the person that gets that term. So let's imagine a world where, uh, I don't know, Nike 
for I could have, could pick on anybody, but let's imagine a world where Nike haven't gone through the process of registering search terms with the voice search providers. And I go to my home uh, voice search assistants and I say, um, call Nike for me or give me the directions to Nike. But it's not Nike that's registered it, it's somebody else. Then that will put me through to the wrong organization. The, the, in legal terms, again, this is something that we've got uh, experience of, even though the technology is new. So this used to be called a bait and switch. Um, and the classic example of this comes from a, a, the US case, actually, to do a trademark law where this, is, and, and this tells you how long ago it was, but th there were signs advertising Blockbuster at the side of a freeway. And you would drive along and there'd be a sign saying, go to Blockbuster to rent a video at the next exit. And then a couple of hundred meters down, there'd be another sign saying, don't forget Blockbuster's next turning. When you turned off, there was no Blockbuster, but there was a, a sort of a shack with Bob's video rentals or something like that. And a sign saying, um, there's no Blockbuster here, but while you're here, you might as well rent a video. You clearly want to rent a video, so come to us. And as you can imagine, lawyers get very excited about those sorts of cases and the implications from a trademark point of view and a brand reputation and so on. But the key thing that I think differentiates voice search from those traditional cases is you don't have the same visual cue. So as a user, you turn up at that shack and you realize it's not Bloodbuster. At what point are you going to realize on a voice search that this isn't the right place? There isn't, it hasn't got the authenticity of a bricks and mortar or a, um, a retail state. Now, the, the, the way the large brands are dealing with that is the way that large brands always do it. They're chucking money at it and they're registering their trademarks. They're looking after their reputation and they are registering things with voice search. But for the smaller providers, it's a real potential issue going forward. So voice search, I think, is something that we're going to see a little bit of. And I think also it's interesting from a consumer point of view that consumers probably won't care about that risk. I always think back to there was a case oh, probably 10 years ago plus where there was a television, major brand television, and it listened to people. And it didn't just listen to people to tell you what to, to change the channel, but it was feeding back that during certain shows, people are angry, the family fall out or the kids are quiet when the kids TV on is all, all that sort of stuff. And when word got out, there was a little bit of controversy in the mainstream stream press. And then there was a collective shrug of the shoulders and everybody said, that's, that's good telly though, isn't it? And, and the thing carried on selling, nobody cared. And I think we'll see the same thing with voice search and the, and the home hubs. Um, last two tech trends, I think, um, again, um, technology, bingo, artificial intelligence. Um, so there's lots of argument and discussion, debate is the word I should use, there's lots of legal debate about liability for artificial intelligence. And again, that's a bit of a red herring. At the moment, the law treats artificial intelligence like a tool, any other tool. If you give somebody a hammer and the hammer is defective, then the hammer manufacturer has a problem. If you give somebody a hammer and they use it incorrectly, then that's the user's fault. Uh, and AI legally in those liability terms, it's as simple as that. But where there are issues, is particularly around the protection of AI, and the coding that goes into AI and transparency. So the traditional way that businesses try to register or protect, sorry, innovation around artificial intelligence is through the patent system. The patent system is a uh, child of the steam age. It likes widgets, it likes um, locomotives and physical products. So anything where you're trying to protect innovation around AI or software is square peg round hole. Part of the other issue is that in order to get patent protection, you have to provide your recipe. You have to tell the world how your software does what it does. There are lots of AI businesses that go down the patent route. And for most AI businesses, patents are inappropriate. Um, and and, and it's, it's a tragic thing really that so many of them spend so much money on it when it's not the right thing. That's a different matter. But one of the, for our purposes, the key risk is that you're giving away how this technology works. That becomes a public document. And that then creates issues around transparency of the code, vulnerabilities in the code, but also involves uh, issues around transparency for individuals to understand how AI is being used. So uh, a, a little while ago, again, a few years ago now, and again in the States, there was an individual who had gone through a court process and was denied bail. They were denied bail because the computer, the AI, said, no, you can't have it. And when they appealed and said, I need to know the reason why I've been refused bail, the AI proprietor was able to say, no, you can't have access to what went on behind the scenes because that's our proprietary intellectual property. So we have a real tension at the moment in the AI space around how we incentivize that innovation, i.e. through the intellectual property system, but also provide the transparency without giving away too much information so that you introduce vulnerabilities into that system. 
No answers to that bit yet, but watch this space. The other thing finally on, on the text summary just before I wrap up is, is open source. And again, I won't rehearse the, um, the security issues with open source because I'm sure the people in the room are familiar with those, but what we're seeing is again, a backward trend amongst innovators. So um, an increased appetite for using open source and absorbing all of the vulnerabilities that that might contain, but a growing awareness on the part of investors um, who are increasingly asking the questions about open source and security. And uh, we're seeing the value of deals dropping because of open source issues. So finally, just to wrap up and with, with those predictions, which I predicted I would end with, um, I think a key thing that we're going to see more is, is consumer trust. Um, increasingly, people are buying from businesses that they are never going to interact with in a physical capacity. For brand owners, that means we've seen an increase in trademark protection because trademarks are the way that brand owners control their brand and their reputation and what people say about them. But also, I think for individuals, we're starting to see more and more trust in a brand and trust in how that data is going to be used becoming a more important part of their consumer purchasing process. And that's at a time when tech companies are giving it probably less credence in their development stage. They're coming across the security washing stuff that I spoke about, but actually at build, they're not really giving it that much thought. Um, we've got a change in the top at the ICO uh, coming. So um, they've made it clear that they're gonna be focusing on particularly ad tech, so this is uh, web tracking stuff and, and stuff that, again, voice search, what might be listening to you. Again, creating um, databases about you that those that then contain vulnerabilities uh, and also health tech. So, again, an area where lots of people are thinking, can we do this rather than should we do this? I think I've said this uh, before the pandemic and I still think it could happen. I, I think we're going to start seeing the shift of data as a commodity. So at the moment, the idea of data as a commodity is all in the favor of the business. But as users, as you and I, as data citizens become more aware, I think we will soon get to a stage where people are trading their data for services. And I, I think that will be low key to start. So it will be, you can sign up to play this game on your phone for free. If you sign up for this game, but you also give us your date of birth, your postcode, then you can have these avatars to play in the game. And I think it will start with that sort of thing uh, and, and that's quite liberating in a way, but it's also quite dangerous because it, it legitimizes whatever that, in my example, gaming company wants to do in exchange for the avatar. But it, I, I can see that becoming much more overt. And finally, just um, the very last point is that um, from a data protection and a cybersecurity point of view, we'll all be um, uh, familiar with the um, uh, concept of doing privacy impact assessments. So just like a health and safety assessment before you do anything, before you engage with anybody, before you do anything with any data, conduct a privacy impact assessment. We're starting to advocate that businesses also do an ethical impact assessment because a privacy impact assessment is all about how secure is the data? What am I doing to minimize the risk? An ethical impact assessment would be more about actually, are we doing this for the right reasons? The business reason being, if we're not doing it for the right reason, this is gonna be reputational suicide. So that I hope is useful, um, but um, those are yeah, what we're seeing at the moment in attitudes, tech, um, and some risky predictions for the future. So um, thank you.